Three or four things. First, we, we're skipping a lot, aren't we? aren't we? We're skipping the rest of the Pentateuch and, and Joshua and Judges and Ruth and jumping right into 1 Samuel. I want to do a little bit of review about what's happening uh, to set the context for 1 Samuel. And then we, I want to look at these two, these two women, one's childless and really mocked and ridiculed. And it's almost emblematic of Israel's situation as they're oppressed by the Philistines. And then we see that God is going to do something in bringing a prophet. There's a famine in the word. He's going to bring little Samuel uh, into the world to judge uh, the high priest and then to begin really the deliverance of Israel. Um, so let me open in a word of prayer and then we'll begin in uh, 1 Samuel. Um, we'll actually begin in Joshua 24. I think that's probably a good place for us to begin with, with the review. So let us pray together. Our Father and God, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for these accounts of your dealings with your people, of not just dealings, Lord, but you, you act on their behalf to deliver them uh, from oppression and, and sin. And Lord, you also give them commands that they should walk in and obey. And even as they rebel, Father, you, you are still kind to, to hear their prayers and their cries and come to their aid. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your character that's revealed uh, in these books and how you, you never leave us nor forsake us. And so speak to us today. Lord, we need to hear and be comforted by what you would have to say for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, remember, we left off, off obviously at the end of Exodus, okay? And they're still in the promised land and the Lord is going with them in the tabernacle. Leviticus uh, deals with basically, the tabernacle was called, obviously the tabernacle, but it was also called what? The tent of meeting, exactly. And so Leviticus deals with a lot of the priestly uh, rituals and the, the cultic worship of the Lord that they might meet and commune with God. And then we get into you know, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And what Deuteronomy is, is, is a covenant renewal document. Because you remember, the first generation that is delivered from Egypt, they're fairly disobedient. Many of them are struck down in the wilderness. And so what we're dealing with in Deuteronomy is, is a whole covenant renewal document with a preamble at the beginning, a historical prologue about God's mighty acts of deliverance. And then the stipulations run from basically chapter 5 on and then what you have in chapter 28 are these blessings and curses. Blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And, you know, if they obey, they're going to be eat, drink, be merry, fruitful, multiply, peace. But then the curses, if they disobey the stipulations of the covenant, they're going to have foreign oppression. There's going to be famine in the land. Their wombs are going to be barren. And so it's, it's these temporal, typological Blessings or curses. They're types of heaven or types of hell, okay? Based on their relative obedience to the Mosaic Covenant. And so what happens, though, is, of course, they know they're going to they're gonna disobey and turn from God. In chapter 30, he allows an opportunity for repentance. If they repent, if they cry out, after the curses come upon them, then the Lord will hear and deliver them. So that's Deuteronomy. And then Joshua is, of course, them conquering the promised land and driving out many of the inhabitants. But then in chapter 24, you have almost this like covenant renewal document. So skip ahead with me to chapter, chapter 24. If you notice, the title of the chapter is the covenant renewal at Shechem, right? And when you think of covenant renewal, you're like, which covenant? And of course, the promise, the main promise that, that, that undergirds all of the Old Testament is, hey, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. He's going to crush your head and you're going to bruise his heel. It's this promise of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to overcome the serpent and the enmity that the serpent has against Christ and against the offspring of God. And of course, that's manifest in the Abrahamic promise. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, right? But then on this other layer is this Mosaic covenant of temporal typological blessings and curses where people can look to what's signified in the sacrifices and be blessed and commune with God. But then in Deuteronomy, uh, there's all these blessings and curses. And then in Joshua 24, the covenant's renewed. So the covenant that's being renewed is not the Abrahamic covenant. It's the Mosaic covenant. It's the Mosaic Covenant in the Promised Land after they've basically uh, taken out a lot of the foreign, foreign or the people, the native people that occupied the land. This is again, uh, who are you going to serve? That's the question that Joshua's putting forward to them. 
And it's the question that, that's really always put forward to us every day when we wake up, right? Every time we're tested, every time we're tempted, every time we're prone to, to think that this world is all there is or our flesh is all there is. So look in verse 14. He basically, you know, gathers everyone. He says, uh, he reminds him in verse 2, we're in Joshua 24. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Okay, so when you think about it, why did Abraham deserve to get called? He didn't. His father was an idolater. It wasn't that Abraham said, no, let me not do the idolatry. Okay, like they're worshiping other gods beyond the river and God in his grace calls Abram, says, you know, leave your father, your kindred your, and, and follow me. And he does, right? And God gives him this promise to bless all nations through him. Then gives him Isaac. So what, what Joshua's doing is giving them a little history, right? Their parents were pretty rebellious. This is the second generation. They've just had great victory and now they're sitting besides olive trees that they didn't plant and houses that they didn't build. They're going to be pretty prosperous. And so God doesn't want them to forget, hey, when you, when you have it high on the hog, don't forsake me. Don't worship other gods. So he's given them this little history lesson here. And then look what he says. Um, he delivered them from Egypt. You see verses 6 and following. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, right? I judged Egypt. They cried to me 24-7. I judged Egypt. Then these prophets conspired against them. I took care of them too. And now I've, I've given you in verse 11, right? I've given you the land of these native people. I've given them into your hand, verse 11. I drove them out. Verse 13, this is key. I gave you land on which you have not labored and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. So do you see the history lesson? It's like all grace, right? I called you out of idolatry. I delivered you from harsh treatment in Egypt. I've overwhelmed these enemies and I've given you this that you haven't labored or worked for. Okay, we'll serve you, God. No, he knows like the intents of our hearts, like evil continually, right? So verse 14 is important. Now, therefore, serve the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your, your father served in this region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So think about it, right? God's not trying to twist people's arm to make them worship. He's like, hey, if you think it's evil to, to worship me, then serve these other gods. But the fact is the other gods are there. And it's a lot of, uh, what is it? Superstition. Right? Prosperity, if you call on the rain god or if you sacrifice to the Baals, God's going to bless you. Fertility. And the people say, what do they say? Far be it from us. Verse 16, you see that? Verse 17, God delivered us out of Egypt. He's preserved us. He drove out the peoples. They're basically just summarizing what Joshua already told them, right? They're just reciprocating the history that God said through Joshua. And then Joshua, verse 19, he says, uh, you're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, and he will turn and do harm, do you harm and consume you after having done you good. People said, no, 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 we'll serve the Lord. You get the picture, right? Then there's witnesses. There's witnesses. It's a classic covenant renewal. He's, and then he charges them again, put away the foreign gods. And turn to the Lord. You see, that's the thing about repentance. It's not just, oh, I hate my sin. Let me put away my sin. I remember um, my, my grandma and grandpa, my mom's parents, uh, grandpa sold insurance in the East Bay, like Vallejo, California, which is, uh, you know, rough area. He'd go door to door, sell insurance. And my mom's mom worked in a bank. She was a teller, really good with people. Both had great personalities. They loved to smoke cigarettes. They love to smoke cigarettes, right? You know, people back in the 80s, they'd have two going in like one hand sometimes, right? Drinking, you know, it's like happy hour all the time when the families get together. And right before they retired, they moved a trailer into our backyard in the Bay Area because they were going to retire somewhere else. So they'd come down, work during the week, stay in the trailer in the weekend. And then they retired and they wanted to stop smoking. And so uh, they stopped smoking for a little bit. 
And, you know, they're raised Catholic and pretty burnt out on the Catholic Church. Irish Catholic, both of them like 100% Irish. And um, I remember they, they wanted to stop smoking, so they stopped smoking. And then I remember we went up to, to Clear Lake where they retired and went to visit. And my grandpa would always sneak away to the garage and, you know, <laughs> he'd don't tell your grandma. Like, as, as if she didn't know or she couldn't smell it or he was, you know, like, how do people, like, the thing is, we can't, like, just turn from something if we don't turn to the Lord. People have quit smoking and quit drinking without, you know, being saved. That's not my point. My point is, if you turn from other gods, or if you're trying to turn from your sin, you're always going to exchange it for some other, something else, unless you're really turning to God. And so when he says, turn, put these idols away, and then embrace God, that's the key point of repentance and transformation. We have to turn from God. We can't just say, oh, I know it's bad, and it's bad. Let me go do something else. No, repent. A confession is agreeing with God that it's bad, right? Just agreeing. And then repentance is turning from that and turning to God. It's really a change of mind. But it's also a turning to God. And we can't forget that. A lot of people just think, oh, just knowing it's bad. That's like, uh, you know, the first third of repentance, right? You've got to agree with it and own it and then turn to God and then, you know, reform your life in the strength that God provides. And of course, they think it's a piece of cake. We'll do it, no problem. Verse 24, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. So he makes a covenant, okay? And then he says a witness against him. So what happens in Judges? Well, Judges is a downward spiral, okay, of um, apostasy. Apostasy. Okay, meaning they turn from the Lord. There's this downward spiral of apostasy. And then what happens? Foreign oppression, right? There's some oppression. And then what do they do? Yeah, they, they cry out to the Lord. They, they call upon the Lord or, you know, they repent. And then what does the Lord do? Yeah, he sends it like a judge. And then they have, uh, you know, some, some peace. Things are good in a sense, for a little while. But it's the constant pattern you see throughout Judges. They're, they have it high on the hog. They turn from the Lord. The covenant curse comes upon them, right? Foreign oppression. And they're overwhelmed by their enemies. And then what happens? They get fed up with it. And then what do they do? Yeah. Well, they call upon the Lord, and the Lord raises up a Samson, right? Or, you know, the first couple chapters you can see... Uh, he raises up judges. It, it's, it's, um, and of course, if you look in verse 11, look, look, just look in verse 11 of Judges 2. And this sets the stage for 1 Samuel. We're going to get to 1 Samuel in a second. It says, verse 11, Joshua dies, right? And then verse 11, verse 10 actually, And all that generation were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And that's a key. To, that's a key. It's not just a, a tautology. It's not just saying the same thing in two different ways. You will not know the Lord unless you know his work. And if you don't know his work, you will not know the Lord. And so obviously they're paying no mind to his great deliverance from Egypt. Or not just his deliverance, but what? Hey, where'd we get this house? How did we get this peace? How did we get these blessings? Like he warns them in Deuteronomy 8 over and over. He's like, hey, when you get into that land, be careful lest you say with your own strength you provided all this. God did this because he loves you and because he cares for you. So this other generation, smooth sailing, right? You can think of that like uh, historically and probably a couple generations right now in our own nation, right? Just never really fought in a war, have faced a couple... You, even, um, this is a terrible phrase, but even those born after like 50 to 50, 50 to 60, most of them didn't fight in a war. Most of them have gone through a couple economic like turndowns. But when it comes to like real challenges, like nationally, like people have had all their individual personal sufferings, but it's been like a lot of prosperity, right? And of course, you think of children and children like, oh, they've always had it fairly good, except for personal existential sufferings. But like nationwide, like you tend to forget like your heritage, right? These people have forgotten their heritage of grace and deliverance and God's goodness. They forgot the Lord's works. 
And if you don't know his works, you won't really know him. Remember Paul says, consider the goodness and severity of God in Romans. And you're like, no, I just want to consider his goodness, right? No, the, the severity, the judgments of Egypt, the striking down of these, these, these idolaters in the land to give it to Israel. It was like almost a, a type of, of, of second coming of Christ's judgment. It was almost like a breaking in of eternal judgment on these people in the land. It's very sobering. Like, how can that be just and fair? But, you know, God is, is just. Go ahead. They're sacrificing children. They're worshiping idols. They're dishonoring God. The thing is that the second generation went into the land with Joshua and Caleb. They're pretty much preoccupied with driving out part of them. They didn't get the whole thing. But they forgot to tell their children what's going on. So they grow up and in them can't do least squat what's going on. And that's why you get 350 years of apostasy. Yeah. And they, they learn about the futility of idolatry, you would hope, right? right? As they turn away and they see that they're oppressed, it's like, a, it's like a warning sign. It's like a trumpet blast, like warning. This is obviously not working. You're going against the grain of the universe and against the, the grain of the covenant. Like Deuteronomy promised all this. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. So then they're oppressed. Then they see God deliver and they're like, yay. But then it's a downward spiral. So it's not just this cycle. It gets really bad to the point where everyone's doing what in their own eyes? Exactly. That's how Judges ends. And that's how Samuel basically, you get Ruth. But then Samuel begins. The very last verse in Judges. And we're going to pick up here in Samuel. In those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And you're like, ooh, this isn't good. Right? And then so you get this picture of... Um, when you think he's going to tell the story of the rise of the kingdom, right? First, second Samuel or first Samuel. And you think if you're going to tell the story of the rise of a kingdom, wouldn't you start in chapter eight or um, with the battle of Afek or, or the, their request for a king? And he starts rather obscurely with these two women and this husband. And so let's look at this. There's Elkanah. He's there, right? He has two wives. You remember his wife's name? Penaniah and Hannah. And of course, Penaniah has children, and Hannah has no children. This guy loves, loves Hannah, and so he gives her a double portion, and they go up every year. And let, let's look in verse 5, okay? But to Hannah he gave a double portion, 1 Samuel 5, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So when you think of having children, it's huge back then. That was like your livelihood, your future, your legacy. And to be barren was almost being seen as being, you know, cursed, cursed of God. And of course, when you think of the women, um, the theme of barrenness is, is huge, right? You think of uh, Rebecca, um, Rachel, right? Throughout the Old Testament, like these women, um, barrenness is, is key. So you think God's going to do something here. Right? And of course, Elkanah says, you know, honey, aren't I better to you than ten sons? You see this guy? He says that in verse 8, right? <laughs> why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? He's like, what a piece of work, right? What's the answer to that? No, no exactly. She wants some kids, right? And in a sense, she's not eating. She's broken, but she's also fasting. And the next thing she's going to do is, is pray. And they eat and drink. And then, of course, you think of Eli is sitting beside the doorpost. And look at Hannah, verse 10. So beautiful. She's deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And of course, you think of why she's so distressed. No kid, but why else? Her rival's accusing her, provoking her, mocking her, calling her out. And so what you have in these two women is, again, the offspring battle. And it's, it's emblematic of Israel, because right now Israel is what? They're, they're, they're under oppression from the Philistines. Okay? They're, they're being like in a sense, overwhelmed or soon to take losses on the battlefield from the Philistines because of their unfaithfulness. There's a famine of the word in the land. God's judgment is upon them because of their sin and idolatry. And yet these two like obscure women and this guy is where the Lord begins to tell his story 
about how he's going to deliver them. And of course, the prophet thinks she's drunk, right? Or the priest. What does that tell you about the priest? Is he discerning and perceptive? No. Yeah, he's very dull. He's very dull. And, and you get the picture of it in chapter 2. His eyes, he's almost blind. Well, it's physical, right? Obviously, it's not lying. But it's, it's really a picture of his spiritual condition as well. He's very dull. She thinks she's drunk. And, and um, Eli's watching her mouth, right? Verse 13, Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. Why did she say, I'm pouring out my soul. To the... And he says, hey, go in peace. The Lord's going to provide for you. Sure enough, the Lord provides, right? And, and the thing is, like, the Lord remembers Hannah and grants her request. And if you think of, of the, the, the history of God hearing the cries of people, like he hears um, the people crying out in Exodus, doesn't he? And he opens the womb of Egypt and delivers them out ultimately, right? And she weans them, she brings them to Shiloh, she dedicates them to the Lord. And then you see this theme really of adoption. Um, you think of the high priest is Eli. And, and in a sense, he takes Samuel as his son, doesn't he? You see this all throughout First and Second Samuel. It's not Eli's natural sons. Those are some corrupt priests. But it's, it's Samuel, in a sense, who's Eli's son. Um, you think of Saul, in a sense, is adopted as Samuel's son. And then later, David becomes son-in-law to Saul, right? And much about David's reign in Second Samuel is taken up recording these difficulties with his sons. And so you have this case in First and Second Samuel, as you read, just to remind that, that often biological sons are almost replaced with adopted sons. And um, what happens is Eli and his sons will be replaced by Samuel, right? Samuel's sons, remember they become corrupt, are going to be replaced with Saul. And then Saul's sons are supplanted with by who? David, David exactly. And so... Um, I guess what I, what I draw from the story here is when you think of God's going to do something so great and so amazing, and he starts accounting this story of the, the, there's going to be cosmic implications to Saul and to David and Israel and their kingdoms and God's purposes. And yet he starts with a very broken woman with challenges domestically in the house with great suffering and childbearing and child rearing. And it's so beautiful how God knows those details about his people and how he's not ashamed to record them for us and how much God cares about what's going on in our own homes and our own lives. Mary and Joseph on a donkey got no place to even sleep. Yeah. God works for his, you know. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, you know, the, the, the theme here, like you're saying, is, is a persevering faith of, of Hannah in the midst of what? Yeah, interpersonal struggles. Like she's childless. She goes and fasts and she's not gnashing her teeth at God. How could you, Lord, put me in this situation with this piece of work and this guy who thinks he's better to me than 10 sons? Can you imagine day in and day out? You're in the era. You think that's her favorite time of the year to go up? Oh, thank you for the double portion, hubby. No, she's just reminded she has no kids and she's provoked. And so I think um, it's preserving faith of really an obscure person and she's without political influence. It's great brokenness, but what's, what's magnified here? Great faith. And then the great faithfulness of our God to know and to see and to act. Like these are the first moves of God like working in 1 Samuel. It's, it's a great story of, of bravery and significance. Like these are stories. This is a story of persevering and overcoming faith in the midst of great obstacles and darkness where you can almost not even see the way out. Um, you know, most people will tell the story when the plant is, is up and flourishing from the soil. This is like the seeds and the scattering and the plowing. Like God attends to all that. Um, and, and like Bruce says, 
You know, think of all that Joseph had to endure with the obscure way that Mary was with child, right? It's, it, even Ruth, um, Exodus, the patriarchs and their wives. Um, I think there's a great danger of like neglecting or denying uh, the significance of, of personal struggles and, and, and victories of the faithful. So often we just want to focus on the victory, <laughs> on what came out on the other side, rather than the way we were tested and broken and humbled to the point to where we're fasting and crying out to God for deliverance and saying, you know, maybe we don't get the child and all the earthly blessings that she gets, right? And we don't see it. And that's, of course, not promised to us, is it? But what is promised is ultimate deliverance and healing. And so you can look at these stories and see God's faithfulness. He's so faithful to you. He's so sovereign over all things. Um, and, and I would just say this. Your calling isn't necessarily Saul or like Samuel or David, right? It's, it's very ordinary each day with the tests and the trials you face that are imperceptible to most. Most people don't even know that part of your struggle or you. And yet you have God with you um, to strengthen you and to carry you along and, and to deliver you and to see you through your grief or your challenges or your brokenness is a great story of persevering faith. And so don't lose heart if you don't see all the light and the signs in this world. <laughs> because the very best is yet to come. And so look at Hannah. It's, it's a beautiful story. Let's look at her prayer. Um, let's look at her prayer. You know, her prayer is really a sign that God's going to turn things upside down, isn't it? Look what she says in verse 1. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord, right? My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Who, who do you think are her enemies? <laughs> Penaniah, right? The one who's mocked her. Now she has a child, but then what does she do with this child? She keeps her vow. You think of the brokenness of being like ridiculed for all those years as they go up to Shiloh. Well, now she has to actually keep her vow and give to the Lord. And what does she do when she gives up the child? Oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. No, she's worshiping the Lord. She's like committing. And so it's really, you get the picture of it's, it's through great brokenness and God's great deliverance and answer that she has great faith. And she's not mustering it up on her own. She's seen a God who's acted. And so I don't think she like with white knuckles like gives Samuel up. She gives him up to keep her vow because she's faithful to God and then gives a great song of praise. Um, look what she says in verse 2. There's none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him, actions are weighed. So you think our prayers, she's obviously been blessed. And we've talked about this really throughout our lessons in Genesis and Exodus. The double-edged sword of blessing or curse, right? So she's being cursed by Penaniah. You childless, forlorn, you know, whatever. And of course, Elkanah loves Hannah more than Penaniah. And so that makes her hate Pen uh, Hannah that much more. And then so now she's blessed with uh, Samuel. She hands him over. But, you know, she's, she's not afraid to praise God for his judgment or at least hope in his judgment. And the judgment is broader implications than just Penaniah. What God's going to do, if you look in um, verse, verse 8 she's, or verse 5, the barren has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit the seat of honor. He, verse 9, He will guard His faithful ones, but the wicked will be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against him, them He will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And when you, when you think about why this prayer, what's going to happen? It's similar to Mary's prayer. Remember Mary's prayer? God's going to begin to turn things upside down. Um, 
Anna's prayer. Hannah sees in this young child the glad tidings of what God has done and is going to do, right? It's a reversal. We're going to see a reversal of the political and spiritual fortunes of the nation. Because right now, politically, what's happening to them? They're oppressed by the Philistines. They're under the covenant curse. The high priest is like almost blind physically, and he's, he's pretty darn blind spiritually. And his sons, if you, if you read about all this wicked and their judgment and the Lord killing, uh, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces. How is that going to be fulfilled in the very next chapter or two? God is going to strike down Eli and Eli's house. And he's going to begin to do like a good work through, of course, Samuel. Any comments or questions? Go ahead, Barry. Let's get there. We're going to get there. We're going to get there right now. Okay? We, no, it's, it's good. We're going to get there. So bottom line is all we have is this woman being ridiculed by this other woman, right? And they're married to the same guy. And the guy thinks he's like the greatest thing ever, better than 10 sons. Okay? She, the priest is so blind, he thinks she's drunk when she's fasting and praying. She keeps her vow and then gives this great song of blessing and curse. And throughout chapter 2, she's obviously given Samuel. And I just want to look at a few verses because what's happening, it's pretty subtle. Look at verse 11, 18, 21, and 26. We see these little markers that Samuel's growing, growing. Look at 11. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. Verses 21 and 26. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. So those are shot through, and there's a big contrast between Eli, right? You think of Eli's sons. Rather than read, read it to you, I'll tell you what's happening. Okay? Eli's sons... Um, Hophni and Phineas, what are their names? Is there, are there other names? I'm, bl I'm blowing it right now. Worthless men, right? Do you see that in verse 12? Why are they worthless? When people offered a sacrifice, what would the priest do? Yeah, give it to me. Even why it's wrong. Give, give me that. And that's profane. You're profaning the, the thank offering or the peace offering of God's people. Like there was some was to be waved, some was to be eaten by the priest, some was to be eaten by the worshiper. It was like an Old Testament like sacrament. You'd commune with God. You wouldn't just offer it, but you'd, you'd enjoy it yourself. Give me that. And look, look, they'd take it up, right? And then look what happened. Um, they even threatened people. Look in verse 15. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And the people, you know, these people are coming <laughs> because it's in their backyard. No, they're trying to be faithful to the Lord. And they're bringing their sacrifice, their very best, right? Not the un unclean sacrifice, but the very best that they've labored for. They're sacrificing, peace offering, sin offering, guilt offering, like fellowship offering to the Lord. And these guys are shaking them down. And they're even threatening, not just the priests, but of course the priests have these like El Capos, these little servants doing the dirty work with the threats. And not only that, what they're doing is shacking up with these virgins who were guarding the tabernacle doors. And they were, of course, you think of Israel as what? Supposed to be the bride of Christ. Holy, pure, radiant. These virgins were like almost a, a sign of that. Sincerely serving to the Lord, innocent, undefiled. And these priests, the high priest's sons, are shacking up with them. It's, it's absolutely terrible. And Eli hears all this, right? Look in verse 22. Eli was very old and he kept hearing. You catch that? It's not just one time. He kept hearing all that his sons were doing in all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he said to him, you know, why do you do this? It's not a good report, my sons. If someone sins against man... God will mediate for him. But if someone sits against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they wouldn't listen, 
right? And you see Samuel contrasted. So then the guy sends a prophet, right? I don't want to just summarize the narrative because you guys read it, okay? Um, what do you think of Eli's rebuke? What do you think of Eli's rebuke, class? He's right, right? No teeth. No teeth. No teeth, right? What should he have done to his sons? Yeah, more than words, some actions, right? They're, they're DQing themselves. They're profaning the sacrifice and the offering of the Lord. And when it comes to the Lord and worship, God, God doesn't mess around. Like we're only to do like what's revealed and commanded. Do you want to add something? Should he have, they should have stoned them or something, right? Because by the law of Israel, it should have been, he should have took his own sons out. Right or no? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. That's terrible of me. I should know these things. They shouldn't have been where they were. Probably put to death when you think of profaning the sacrifice of the Lord. Like what the priests were supposed to do was protect any, anything from being done incorrectly or improperly or any outsiders coming in to make it unclean. And what they're doing themselves is profaning it. Yeah, I mean, they're shacking up with virgins. Like the, the, the Pentateuch's full of, uh, of what's required for those who do that, for profaning the sacrifice of the Lord. So I don't know the chapter and verse, Mindy, but... It shouldn't have just been some mild, limp-wristed rebuke. What do you want to add, Jesse? You have the example of Nadab and Abihu being submitted by God. And then you have Phineas. I can't remember who exactly he took out, but he was taking the tree physically. He was guarding and keeping the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. And this guy's name is Phineas or Phineas, and he's not even doing like what he should, what his namesake is, right? Um, why is all this happening? Right? The prophet judges, right? Eli, you know, doesn't do his faithful duty because he's the high priest. He's the one in charge of everything. Like everything's under his watch. He needs to keep this, th this stuff from being profaned. So the Lord sends a prophet. And of course, here's the picture of Israel. Look in verse chapter 3, verses 1 and following. <clears throat> There's a, like a threefold lack of light happening. Now the boy Samuel is ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. <clears throat> so let's stop there. Why is that happening? Why is the word of the Lord rare? We just saw a prophet give God's word of judgment to his uh, terrible high priest. Why is the word of the Lord rare in those days, you guys? It's hard to understand. Why is the word of the Lord rare? They're under God's judgment. Remember, apostasy. The priests are profaning. God's people are worshiping idols. All of Judges is this cycle of people turning away from the Lord, foreign oppression, covenant curses. They call and repent. God raises up to judge to deliver him, and they have it all good for a generation or a few years. And then they turn again. And so right now, they're under this apostasy oppression. Like God's judgment is upon them. And what God's doing here is he's going to raise up not even any judges, but like a faithful prophet in Samuel. And you can see that um, the word of the Lord's rare. And then look in verse 2. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel's lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And the Lord calls to Samuel, right? Here I am. And what does Samuel think? Who does Samuel think is calling him? <laughs> Eli. So he runs to Eli three times or two times, however. And Eli is so spiritually imperceptive that he doesn't even realize what's happening. Do you get the picture? Like Eli is, I don't mean to like gang up on the guy, but it's, it's not good. And, and when you think of... Um, how the Lord calls him. Samuel, again, he goes and runs, you know. Samuel didn't know. You see that in verse 7? Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again, verse 8. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, O Lord, for your servant hears. 
verse 10. This is an important verse here. It's a lot in this verse. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Why the, the double uh, name? So fourth times the charm, right? <laughs> Think of, think of times thus far where the Lord has said someone's name twice. Like, what comes to mind? Samuel, Samuel. Like, that's very loaded that the Lord would repeat it. Remember when Abraham's about to offer uh, Isaac up, right? The child of the promise. What does God say? Abraham, Abraham, right? <laughs> um, think of Jacob. Jacob, remember all that he went through. Um, he thinks, who's dead? Joseph's dead. Right? He's, there's no way he's going to let Benjamin go into Egypt. Right? And his sons are like, no, no, Joseph's alive. Let's all go to Egypt. And, and, and of course, Jacob's like, I don't know about this. Right? These guys are scoundrels. They killed one of my sons. They killed all these other people. Like, are they going to take me out on the way? Is it going to be bad once I get to Egypt? Am I going to die? And so he's on the way there. And you think of all that Jacob's been through. Right? Wrestling with God. Running from Esau like going from a boy to a man. And then as he's on his way, the Lord says what? Jacob. Jacob. And like reassures him that you're going to go to Egypt. There's going to be famine. God's going to provide for you. And your people are going to be delivered from there. Right? Am I going to sell out on God's promise and go to some foreign country? No, God promises him. And then, of course, the third time you think of when God says, you know, Moses, Moses, Right? It's a burning bush. And so this Samuel, Samuel is, is big. I know it seems like I'm belaboring that. But what, what I think the narrator or what God is doing, he's making it clear that he's about to do something like pretty wild. Like these are huge events like in redemptive history. Going to Egypt, getting delivered. The Lord's name gets a lot of props from that. God is the God who judges and who delivers. Abraham, Isaac, child of the promise. Moses, Obviously, he's the one who's going to be the prophet and the deliverer. And so, and notice the story doesn't just say that God speaks. What does it say? The Lord stood, right? And you get a sense that there's some sort of theophany there. You remember theophany? They're, they're um, intensive, mediated displays of divine presence. So we don't know what the theophany was. Smoke fire, some veiled type of glory. But as Samuel's like going to bed there and getting up and running back and forth, like the Lord doesn't just call, but he comes to stand as authoritative covenant God, right? And, and of course, he gives judgment, doesn't he? And when you think of the judgment, this is, this is obviously Samuel's what, what kind of witness here? He's a second witness. The prophet came. Eli didn't reform his ways. And now the Lord's going to reveal himself to Samuel to judge the high priest. And it's interesting because <clears throat> the Lord repeats the judgment given in chapter 2. But, and Samuel's set up as a second witness. But he's also acting as a prophet. And he's going to be a prophet to who? The high priest. And the Lord has chosen Samuel to speak... Uh, rather than Eli. The Lord is going to speak through Samuel to Eli. And there's, of course, judgment on Eli and his house. And after hearing this, look at after he hears the Lord, um, verse 11, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel, at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. I will declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming and God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. And then look in verse 15. It says, Samuel lay until the morning. Uh, it doesn't say he slept much, right? How do you think he slept? Yeah, Eli's been, remember the theme of, of adoption and non-biological sons supplanting biological sons. Samuel, Eli's sons, right? Saul, Samuel's wicked sons, right? 
David supplants Jonathan. And he loves Eli. Eli may be a piece of work, but Eli is almost like his father to him. And, and you think of when he rises up, look at Samuel lay until the morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. You think of the doors. The doors are often connected with birth and death. You think of, remember when Hannah was um, really overwhelmed and she goes to the tabernacle to pray. And where's Eli sitting? Sam, she's fasting. She's praying for a son. She's pouring her heart out because she's overwhelmed and ridiculed. Where was Eli sitting? Do you remember? He's sitting on a chair, leaning back. Oh, no, no. That's the judgment comes. He's right by the doors of the temple in chapter one. Yeah, no, when the judgment comes, you're right. But he's right by the doors. You think of, remember, uh, Abraham and, and Sarai. Remember when the angels come to visit to promise Isaac? Where's Abraham? The doors of the tent. Like doors are... are are like pivotal places of, of life and death. Um, opening of doors are often connected with the opening of a womb. You think of, uh, there's a new event taking place. Like, you know, God's going to act through Samuel. And, and you notice what he says when Samuel, when Eli calls him. Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, what did he say? Here I am. Yeah, here I am. Here I am. And those are famous words, aren't they? You remember with the binding of Isaac. Do you remember when Abraham calls Isaac? What does Isaac say? Here am I. Right? Here I am. Um, earlier in the chapters... Obviously, Samuel's offered up to the Lord by his mother. He's like almost like an Isaac figure, right? Hannah offers him up to the Lord. Like she gives him up, comes once a year and makes him a fancy ephod. But other than that, like she's committed him to the Lord. And of course, Eli refers to Samuel as his son here. And it's a difficult word of the Lord that is coming between them. And it's a difficult word comes not to the father, but to the son, You know, in the story of, of Isaac and in this story, the, the expression, here I am, is repeated. It's, it's critical. Like, I remember Abraham, even as they're going up, Abraham's like talking to Isaac and he's like, he, Abraham's present and, and so near to his son Isaac and talking with him and walking with him. And it's the opposite of, um, remember Ishmael and Hagar? Remember when the Lord sends them out? And basically, she sets her son like way over there and she goes like a, a, a bow shot away from him. Like she can't even watch what's going to happen as he's going to die. And she's like removing herself from the situation. But Abraham, in the midst of knowing he has to sacrifice his son, is so present and aware and walking with his son and talking with his son. Like, here are my son. And, and of course, the Lord... Um, in this instance, it's the son who's got to give a difficult word to the father. And there's a movement from the dominance of Eli to that of Samuel. Remember, Samuel's ministering before uh, to the Lord and before Eli. Now Eli's dependent on Samuel to receive the word of the Lord. Eli's going to the back burner now. Do you catch that? Samuel's transitioning from being a son of Eli to being a son of the Lord. And you notice the word that he gives is obviously judgment. And it's a sobering word. How are we doing on time? Um, we need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Um, it's a sobering word of judgment. And Eli gets the word, right? And the Philistines capture the ark. But my, my main point, really, is what I'm going to return to at the very beginning. Is God is doing a huge and amazing thing. He's going to raise up a prophet and he's going to raise up a king. But how does he do it? He starts not with just like the crowning of Saul or the victories of David. But he starts with this woman who has these domestic issues of suffering and hardship, who's barren and childless and forlorn, who's ridiculed by the other wife in the house and mocked and is broken and tested. And what is she? She cries out to the Lord and the Lord sees her and hears her and provides for her. And just keep that in mind. Whatever you're going through, God is so faithful 
And He's doing great things through your imperceptible uh, sufferings and trials that you face. Great things for His glory. Not maybe raising up some prophet or some new king. But He's furthering His kingdom through whatever faithful good works you do in spite of your brokenness and your trials. Like God is so faithful. You've seen that. You've seen that in your life for decades. (laughs) But it's easy to forget. And so often when we're broken and when we're humbled and when we're suffering, it's just another time to be reminded of God's goodness and faithfulness and to see Him come through. If not in this life, then then in the one to come. Um, So let me pray. Father, I thank You for uh, this account of these women and and the wickedness, Lord, that You do not shy away from. Um, And Lord, we thank You that You don't treat us as our sins deserve. Often when we are broken or tested, we stumble and fall. And yet, Lord, You do not allow us to be cast headlong. So we thank You for the way that You've corrected and guided our steps for the way that You have been the lifter of our head before we were cast headlong and that You turn us back to You and, and walk with us and talk with us through Your Word and receive what we have to say as we pray to You and cry out to You. For You are the Lord, our Deliverer. Help us to be faithful in the midst of our own hurt and the challenges that we face. Um, May we cry and may we weep and may we fast, may we pray. And and may we look to You for deliverance and strength. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.